Father God, we have come from far and near with various experiences throughout the week. And yet, we are seeking your divine presence, listening to your divine counsel. It is our fervent prayer that the Holy Spirit will prevail in our meditation as we worship you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
A special message in song. How many of you enjoy it? Praise the Lord. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 34. The Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 34. I'm reading from the New King James Version. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. These are the words of Jesus. May his words be ingrained in our hearts as we meditate on these words. Before Pastor Igan comes up, I'd like to, for us who are new here, I'd like to introduce him to us. Pastor Isagani uh, has been a pastor for 24 years, uh, 10 years in Philippines and 14 years right here in Singapore. Uh, for those of us who have been here long enough, Pastor Igan used to be the associate pastor right here in Belestia to Pastor Mark Chan uh, about a decade ago for about five years. Uh, Pastor Egan happily married to his wife. Maybe we can invite uh, Sister Joy to stand where you are, if you don't mind. Uh, she's over there. We welcome you to Belestia Church. And uh, they also, I believe, have a son together as well. Bless with one. Um, and uh, we like to, of course, uh, Pastor Egan this year has taken on a new portfolio. Uh, he is the discipleship director of our conference. Uh, that will be his role this year as he moves on to have another uh, church. There will be a new Filipino pastor coming to pastor the Filipino church and Pastor Egan will also uh, take on the ministerial secretary role in April as well. So uh, without further ado, we'd like to welcome Pastor Egan to the pulpit uh, to share with us God's word. Having Pastor Chan sitting beside me, and uh, Brother Joseph, and being here for after quite a while, brings back a lot of memory. This was the first pulpit where I preached 14 years ago. The same pulpit where I was married by Pastor Chan as the solemnizing officer. He was also my senior pastor back then, I being the associate. This is also the same pulpit where I was ordained together with my wife in the gospel ministry. I would say to all of you, I feel very much at home. The Lord has been good. The Lord has been gracious in the ministry. And I can only praise the Lord for His goodness and kindness throughout those years. This morning, we will be studying a short story found in the book of Luke, chapter 5. The Bible reported that Jesus Christ is in one of the houses. And being Jesus during those times, a crowd followed him. Apparently, the house was not as big as Ballester to accommodate everyone. And so there are multitude outside even of the house. And from this short narrative, we will be studying three major categories or three major parts. As a certain man was introduced to us in the middle of the crowd, 
we will be looking at his condition, his companions, and his cure, what happened to him. In Luke 5.18, immediately, the focus was given to the man carrying a certain man. Behold, the Bible said, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. Come to think of it, 2,000 years ago, there was no NUH, SGH, Tantok Seng Hospital, or places like Mount Elizabeth, where you can bring those who are having medical problems. And so the appearance of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the community and in the country attracted people from all over the place with maladies, with sickness, hoping against hope that this man, Jesus, whom they said can cure disease will be the answer to their maladies. But this guy is not an ordinary sick guy. You know, sometimes when you're sick, you can even walk to the hospital and bring yourself into the hospital. I remember one day in Baguio City, we were having a seminar, a training for the pastors uh, in Central Luzon Conference in Manila. And we had the training on the mountainous area of Baguio. And suddenly there was a, a persistent pain in my stomach. It was so painful that I could not listen to the one teaching and to the one preaching and to all the training. I went to the hospital myself, brought myself to the hospital. And the doctor suspected that I may be having a kidney stone and I needed an immediate surgery. And I thought, well, nobody here in Baguio City knows me. I better go to Manila, take the six-hour bus ride, and took a lot of pain reliever. I can brought myself to Manila Adventist Medical Center, and I had the surgery on the same evening. But this guy cannot. This guy, apparently, the Bible says, was paralyzed. He was bedridden. He was that bad, the situation. He was infirm. Further description gives us an idea of what's going on with this man. He was paralyzed. You know, paralysis, according to definition, is the loss of muscle function for one or more muscles. It can be accompanied by a loss of feeling in the affected area. There is sensory damage as well as motor damage. So this guy is not only infirm, he was invalid, he was paralyzed. Ellen White even reported the perception of the people in the crowd in Ministry of Healing, page 73. The le like the leper, this paralytic had lost all hope of recovery. His disease was the result of a sinful life. And his suffering were embittered by remorse. In vain, he had appealed to the parasites and doctors for relief. They pronounced him incurable. They denounced him as a sinner and declared that he would die under the wrath of God. So he was not only having a physical malady, apparently by the prescriptions of the Pharisees, you are worse. You are not only physically ill, you are also spiritually ill. And to them, he was simply incurable. You know, through the development of science now in 2024, they are able to create uh, robotic muscles such as this one uh, from exobionics exoskeleton, whereby if you are paralyzed either uh, from your waist down, this can help you move through some programmings, but just the same, this costs about a 100,000 US dollar. And this is not uh, covered by insurance. Even with this, there is no cure for paralysis. In the early 1900, when polio exploded, and there was no vaccine for polio, 
a certain scientist by the name of Philip Drinker thought, what will I do? Because when children contracted polio, what will happen is that they will lose the ability to move and the last thing that was affected so that they die is their lungs. The lungs could not contract, the muscles could not work. So he started to find ways and means and he invented a thing called the iron lung. It creates a reverse compression so that even though the muscle functions of your lungs ceases, the machine can at least breathe, help you to breathe by a reverse compression. This is how it looks like. And this picture is 2024. One of the last surviving patients who benefit from the invention of Alexander Drinker is called Alexander Paul Alexander. He's from the Great Britain. He has been in this iron lung since 1952, about 72 years inside that machine. He's still alive today through the help of that iron lung. But do you know that he was also able to finish doctor in jurisprudence and he is a lawyer? And that he represents people online in their hearing, in their cases. And if people would ask him, why would I take you on as my lawyer, my advocate? He said, if I can survive on this thing for 72 years, I could surely survive your case. I'm the most persistent and the most stubborn man on earth. But can you imagine being sort of imprisoned in this kind of place, in that kind of space? It must have been hard and terrible for this guy, a paralytic man. He cannot move on his own. He could not scratch his back. He could not feed himself. He could not go to the bathroom by himself. Someone else has to do that for him. Gladly, the Bible reported that there are several men who are with him. It was reported on the same verse in verse 18. Behold, men brought on a bed. It was a makeshift bed, but several of them have agreed to bring this man somewhere where Jesus Christ was located or preaching. In this particular text, it tells us that his companions personally cared for him. It was not just someone else. It was this man. You know, when we see someone in need, it's easy for us to say, well, mm, someone else will take care of him, or probably the government, or probably the ministry, or probably the pastor. I'm sure there are several social studies conducted nowadays that in a crowd, people expect that someone will do something, and so they refuse to do anything. But these guys are different. These guys personally cared for him by bringing him over to the place where Jesus was on a bed. Also, in that same verse, the Bible says that they sought to bring him and lay before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And despite of the challenges that they may have gotten into by simply carrying him on that makeshift bed, have you tried carrying a makeshift bed? And you know, there are four corners, and when one lowers certain part of the corner, one part of the corner, then the rest will have to pull heavy. They need a lot of coordinations because if someone will suddenly just simply drop a certain part of that corner, the guy may fall and cause further injury to this guy. They have to cooperate. They have to plan. And when finally they arrive to that place, we do not know how long the journey had taken them. They suddenly realized that there was a big crowd. And they could not find a way that they might bring him in because of the crowd. So they tried probably entering the door. The crowd was too eager to listen to the preaching of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are not given the chance to go in. They have probably tried to go on the back door of the kitchen. Still a lot of people, they could not go in. 
So the Bible reported that they have decided to went up on the top of the house. Ellen White commented, again and again, the bearers of the paralytic tried to push their way through the crowd, but in vain. And here somehow you may see that those people who are blocking the way so that this paralytic man and his friends will be able to see Jesus are basically blocking the way to Jesus. They are not helping this guy. And we think like, you know, when, when you see people in need, when you see people in urgent need, they have this thing called in the hospital triads whereby they would want to know how serious is your situation that makes you come to the hospital. They would check whether, you know, are you having a heart attack? Are you having seizure and things like that? When finally my wife and I went to Senkang General Hospital several years back, she went for a triad. She cut her finger that keeps on bleeding. She went for a triad check and see whether how serious the condition was. And the doctor decided, you're not too serious. And we waited for about six hours. Two years ago, we went to Changi General Hospital. Again, my wife having a pain in her tummy. She went for a triad. And finally, the doctor realized that it was not that urgent. We waited for almost 24 hours in the hallways of Changi General Hospital. We were not, the case was not too serious. But I remember one time in 2014 when suddenly I collapses. While we are preparing for a combined worship service in Bonavista, a star performing of arts, I suddenly collapses. There was an intense drilling on my head. And I suddenly feel so cold and I could not breathe. And the pain was so immense on my head and I could barely breathe. The, the breathing was so shallow. And I collapsed and I was rushed to a hospital in Yishun, KTPH. And immediately they realized I may be having a heart attack or a stroke. They immediately put, put me in, in front of the queue. And everybody has to wait behind me and I was attended to. And then there's a lot of doctors and nurses who were attending my situation. Don't you think this guy is in urgent need too? But the crowd somehow, while the Bible described as this man on the bed as the guy who is paralyzed, don't you think that here there's another group of people who are experiencing paralysis? Paralysis by analysis. They do not want to move. They do not want to give way. Maybe they're too comfortable on their seats listening to the preaching of Jesus. Boy, not today, not this time. I have fought for this position, for this play. I should enjoy the preaching of Jesus Christ. Apparently, there are several people who are undergoing paralysis on our narrative. So the friends decided we have to do something because this guy must see Jesus. This guy must be connected to Jesus. You know, the, the friends of this paralytic sought everything that they could so that he can, they can bring him in and lay before him. Not only are they persistent, not only are they personally taking care of this paralytic man, they also know the plan. They also know what they are supposed to accomplish. They went up on the roof, lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. So not only they are personally involved, not only they are persistently involved, they are purposely connecting him to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they did that probably at one point. Some commentators suggest that they will have to tear down parts of the roof of another guy while Jesus Christ was preaching. 
Because the aim, if you guys are not giving us the way, well, we will make a way. Do you have a friend like that? Someone who will personally ensure that you are accounted for. They will not pass you over to another friend, pass you on to the church expecting and hoping that the church will check on you. But they will do it personally. They will take the time to text you, to WhatsApp you, to call you, and even though you refuse, they will visit you because these kind of friends are persisting friends, persevering friends. Do you have a friend like that? You know, at the end of the day in the church, the purpose of us being friends is so that those people whom we are trying to minister to can be connected to Jesus Christ. That's the purpose, why they are becoming a good friend to this man. And the Bible reported that finally, you know, I do not know what happened. They tear down the roof. Must have been a lot of mess falling from the roof while Jesus Christ was preaching. And probably some of them noticed, hey, something is going on. And then slowly, they lower down these guys from the roof. It disrupts the preaching time of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It disrupts the ongoing divine service because they have to take care of someone who needed to see Jesus Christ. At times, the church can be so focused that we have to perfect the preaching. We need to perfect the music. Nobody should be disturbing us because we're doing church. We don't want the church to be so messy. We do not want any distraction because we want to focus on Jesus. But Jesus accepts disruptions when we are bringing people to Jesus. Because Jesus cares not only to our singing, He cares for those people who need to hear the songs. He not only cares for our prayers, He cares for people who needed to be prayed for. He not only cares for those people inside the church, He cares for people outside of the walls, the borders of the church. He cares for them too. And if the service will be disrupted and the church goes out, Jesus doesn't really, really mind. But if we are able to continue the formality of the functions of our churches and we have forgotten that there are people that need to be brought to Jesus, we're not doing church right. Discipleship is following Jesus and bringing someone in the journey with Jesus Christ. Discipleship should begin in your home. Are you patient with your wife, patient with your children, patient with your relatives, patient with your colleagues, patient with the members of the body of Christ? Are we persevering or do we say, ah, they, do, they know how to go to church, la. they should come. You know, there was a study conducted and many of you have heard this, I have not included in the slide. The latest study of the General Conference Archives and Statistics tells us that about 40% of our church members, our very own church members, are leaving the church, 40%. To them, it's one in every three members in the past few years have left the church. And when they were surveyed, they said, well, nobody approaches us. Nobody asks us why. And I'm so glad that here in Ballester, we have this advocacy, a loving, friendly community. Amen. I would like to affirm the leadership of Pastor Matthew Yuen, Pastor Chuan Rong, the rest of the elders, the rest of you brave souls who said, we will be a prayerful, loving community. Amen. Because that's what church is all about. A church that loves, a church that cares. And if you have not signed up yet, you can sign up to this. Be a befriender. Probably you can just be a friend to your wife first. Stop fighting her. Stop quarreling with him. Probably friendship should begin at home, amen? Probably reconciliation and being kind, being loving and being a good friend should begin among spouses. 
amongst your children. Show them that you are a friend. Show them that you are a caring person. Lastly, when, after the Bible describes how the, the, the companions have brought this paralytic man to Jesus, the Bible describes his cure on the last part. The Bible says, as the story, the narrative is being introduced, that the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. This is how the whole narrative was introduced. This was the first verse to introduce the whole narrative. The power of the Lord was with Jesus. But have you noticed how many of them were healed? There was a huge crowd for sure. And the presence of the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. But only this guy was reported to be healed in that specific situation. So regardless, you may be with Jesus. You may have heard the words of Jesus. But you may not be experiencing the power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ himself. When finally this paralytic man was lowered down in front of Jesus Christ himself. You know, think for a while. What could be going on in the mind of this guy? The paralytic guy. He might have been thinking, oh boy, we don't have enough money to pay for the roof of this guy. But I need to be well. Probably I can work and, you know, later on I'll help fix the roof. Must he be feeling sorry that, you know, he has to disrupt the whole preaching, the whole service of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Ellen White gives us the idea and ministry of healing. Ellen White says, on the mind of this man was running all the guilty feelings, all the bad things that he has done. He was paralyzed because of something that he did, a sinful act that caused him to be in that kind of situations. And now he may be facing Jesus. What would Jesus say for those who are paralyzed by sin? For those who are battered and are losing the trials on the trials of life? He was expecting that he will be receiving judgment, an angry look from Jesus. Punishment, perhaps, which he deserved. But the Bible says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, can you imagine of all the words that Jesus will use to a guy who is sinning? To a guy who knows that the very reason why he was sick in the first place is because of his sin? And the first words that Jesus Christ uttered to him when finally he was being lowered down and now in front of Jesus and their eyes met and he saw the eyes of Jesus and Jesus said, friend. He was ready to get it. He was ready to receive condemnation and judgment and scolding. But when finally he met Jesus Christ, the eyes of Jesus, he saw the compassion of Jesus and the first word that Jesus said, friend. Oh, what he needed at that moment is to once again know that despite of where he had been, despite of the many failings in his life, despite of rebelling against God, despite of that miserable situations because of him trying to fight God, when God finally confronted him, the first word that Jesus Christ uttered in his face is this, friend, I am so glad that Jesus Christ loves the sinner. I am so glad that Christ does not treat us the way we deserve, but Christ treats us the way He loves. Because the Bible says, God loves, and that He comes to rescue sinners, brothers and sisters. You know, this morning, before you become friends, I just suspect, this is just a suspicion. You need to know first, Jesus is your friend. You are accepted. You are forgiven. You are loved. You are welcome. You are expected. You are celebrated. God rejoices in your presence despite of who you are. And only when we are settled knowing that we are accepted, forgiven, loved, celebrated, even wanted by God, can maybe we treat other people with such love that we receive from God? Jesus 
by declaring that he is the friend of that paralytic man, in essence, says that he personally cared for you. He persistently carried you and he purposely connected you by his death on the cross. He teared down the veil that separates man from God the Father by his death on the cross. He connected us. He is our friend. Jesus is our true friend. And finally, the last part of this narrative, the Bible says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. I do not know about you this morning, how many of you needs to hear this. Through Jesus, regardless of your sins, they are forgiven. You don't have to prove yourself to God. You don't have to work your way so that you can be forgiven by simply believing, by simply believing on what has been accomplished on the cross. The Bible says you are forgiven. You're okay through the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, just like the church, instead of saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah, what happened was a Sabbath school discussion, a debate amongst those who were listening. They said, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy, who can forgive sins but God alone? Good question. But have you noticed something's going on here? Instead of them saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah. They went for a debate, a discussion. And oftentimes this happens to us. And Jesus has to respond immediately. He said, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, let's make this clear. I tell you, get up. Take your mat and go home. Amen? Not only did Jesus Christ wanted this guy to be forgiven, Jesus wanted this guy to be restored. And why of all the places he was commanded by Jesus to go is his home. Many scholars and theologians and commentators and even Ellen G. White agrees that the sin, the wrongdoing, was conducted first and primarily at home. Why is it that amongst us Christians, the easiest people for us to hurt and to offend and to neglect are the very people who are very close to us, thinking that they will always be there until they are not. When Christ forgives you, when Christ accepts you, you are commanded to go home. As much as He loves you, as much as He has forgiven you, as much as He has embraced you and accepted you, and when your eyes finally meet His eyes, He said, friend, would you want to go back home and say to your wife, friend, would you want to go back home and gather your children, stare them at their eyes, however puzzled they may be, and tell them, friends, the long-lost friend, a long-lost loved one or relative, would you dare call them in the video after this service and tell them, friend, how much miracle, how much healing, how much joy would the church and our homes experience if we only know how to treat each other, not as enemy, not as some from other race, not as someone from lower position in life, not as someone on a pedestal, but someone who is a friend. Go back home. He immediately took, stood up in front of them took what he had been lying on and went home, praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. We don't have time to explore on this, but my dear brothers and sisters, when the home and the people inside the home experiences forgiveness and healing, everybody around us praise God. Amen. Everybody around us rejoice. Even our dog knows something happened to us because we stopped kicking them around. 
those around us will know whether or not we have accepted healing and loving from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He went up picking up his mat, his makeshift bed, told his friends, don't you worry, guys, I got this. You may think, hey, what does he need to bring the mat home? Ah? No need, le. he can walk ready. But of course, le, that is the place where he was. That was the place where he suffers. That was the place of his trial and his malady. Don't know how many years he was there. And that is the exact place of his testimony. Your mess will be your message. Your brokenness, when God heals you, will become your platform to know so that you will be able to communicate. God can. Look at my bed. I was there. I was there. People are still carrying me. Do not be embarrassed of your past. Make it as a platform to glorify God. To tell other people, if He can do this thing for me, I'm sure He can do the same for you. And this is the proof. Christ's method, we are familiar with this. Ministry of Healing, page 143. Mingle with people, show them sympathy, minister to their needs, won their confidence, and invite them, follow me. Let's begin at home. To mingle with them, eat with your children. Stop using your cell phone during the meal. Mingle with your people. Your people is your wife, your children, your loved ones. Show sympathy to them instead of constantly scolding them, telling them how bad they perform. Let them know that they are accepted, that they can do better, but you are there to help them. Things will change for sure. As I end our devotional this morning, you are familiar with this guy called Christopher Reeve, the man of the steel, Superman. He was one of the best good-looking Superman. By one of his equestrian competition, because he rides a horse, it's called equestrian, Christopher Reeve, the guy who plays Superman, fell on his horse because his horse hesitated to jump on the hurdle, causing him to break his neck, making him quadriplegic. Quadriplegic means he was paralyzed from the neck down. He could only speak but could not move any parts of his body from the neck down. In his memoir, a book he co-wrote with his wife, Dana Reeb, called It Is Still Me, he suggested to his wife, Dana, the one on the picture, maybe we should let me go. You're young, Dana, she wrote. You have many years ahead of you. You know, Dana was about 30 plus, late in the 30s, when Christopher Reeb suffered that equestrian accident. And so in that memoir, Christopher Reeve was trying to plead and convince Dana, just let me go. I do not want to be a burden to you. You have many years ahead of you. Enjoy your life. Just let me go. But Dana strongly retorted and objected. And he said, she said, we will go through this together. Since you cannot walk, I will push you. Since you cannot move, I will carry you. I will do everything on my power to be your hands, to be your legs, to be your mouth, to be your hair, to do everything because I am not only your wife, I am your friend. After the death of Christopher Reeb, because of too many complications, Dana Reeb only manages to live another 16 months. At the age of 44, Dana Reeb also passes away after taking care of her husband. And everybody thinks and sees love, true love. When finally you may have reasons to abandon, to bail out, 
You have all the excuses not to love. Ah, pastor, you only you don't know my husband, you don't know my wife, you don't know my children. Pastor, you don't know my boss. That's why I'm like this. No, my dear brothers and sisters, the Bible says, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples. Not if you have big churches, not if you have TV, Hope Channel, not if you are rich. The Bible says, the world will know that you are my disciples if we start loving one another. Amen. Loving another people in their worst. That's true love. For my last quotation for you, the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ expressed in character is an exaltation above everything else that is esteemed on earth or in heaven. Look at this. This is Maybe you have, have not heard of this quotation. It is the very highest education. It is the key that opens the portals of the heavenly city. What is that? The knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ expressed in character. Your knowing becomes your doing. Since you know that we must love, I will love. Since you know it is a command of God, I will do it. The, the inspired writing says, it is the very highest education that is the shape of a disciple of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning, my dear brothers and sisters, I would like to encourage you. I would like to affirm you. I would like to tell you, you can do it by the grace of God, by the Spirit of God. His command comes along and brings along with it the power so that we can be a loving, prayerful community. May the Lord bless you this morning. Thank you so much for your love. So generously given to each one of us. And now, brothers and sisters, as we depart from this place, may the love that has been given to each one of us becomes the extension of the love in wherever station we will be in this week. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.